causing major controversy across Maryland. And you people are just stealing people's property. That's all you're doing. The Piedmont Reliability Project, a 70-mile transmission line that would cut through three counties. Supporters say it's necessary to support energy needs, but critics... It's going to degrade our property values. Worry the project will ruin Marylanders' land and livelihood. And pressing lawmakers and project leaders for answers. We're going in-depth on the Maryland Piedmont Reliability Project. Thank you for joining us on this week's edition of Fox 45 News In Depth. I'm Mackenzie Frost. Today we're breaking down the Maryland Piedmont Reliability Project. The plan is a 70 mile transmission line that would run through Baltimore, Carroll and Frederick counties. We'll get into PJM and PSEG, the groups behind the project in just a moment, but they say the transmission line is essential to reduce the growing strain on the regional power grid. But Marylanders are worried about the impact the project could have on their properties. Farmers and homeowners alike are concerned about how 70 miles of transmission lines could impact their work and quality of life, or if they might lose their properties altogether. PSEG says if the project does move forward, it wants to reach agreements with property owners to buy their properties at market value. But the group also says if it cannot reach an agreement with property owners, it will seek eminent domain rights from the state of Maryland. Eminent domain allows the government to take private property for public use. PSEG doesn't have eminent domain rights yet and says it would only be used as a last resort. Residents have expressed growing concern for the proposed transmission line over the past few months, but to understand the project, you have to know who's behind it. To really understand this project, you have to understand all of the different acronyms. First, let's start with the MPRP, the Maryland Piedmont Reliability Project. This is what you've probably seen on various yard signs all across the area. It's the roughly $424 million, 70 mile transmission line project that PJM awarded a contract to build. Now PJM is a regional transmission company that coordinates electricity movement through all or parts of 13 different states, including Maryland. And PJM awarded a contract to PSEG in December. PSEG, the Public Service Energy Group, this is the organization or the company that will actually build the transmission line. There's one more acronym that you need to know. The Maryland Public Service Commission, or the PSC, this is the actual state agency that will approve the project. Now, a route has yet to be selected, but I want to show you some of the several options that are being proposed. The 70 mile line would run through Baltimore, Carroll and Frederick counties. You can see it starts at the Pennsylvania line and travels all the way down to Frederick. The yellow lines indicate the different options, but again, a finalized route has yet to be picked. There have been several town hall meetings in these regions, bringing hundreds. People are being told this project is necessary to make the electrical grid more reliable, given the increased demand from data centers and power plant retirements. Their voices are important in this conversation. Now we've talked to several different stakeholders, including the Farm Bureau, which right now is against this project. As we move towards more clean energy and the goal of the state is to advance more clean energy, um, we have a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what farmland will be used for uh, in the future. And farmers that we've talked to argue that this project could negatively impact their land and their livelihood. The number of lives and lifestyles, livelihoods that they're disrupting, you know, I just hope that they're looking at the options and making sure that this is the best option. But it's not just farmers raising the red flags. We've talked to several homeowners who are concerned that this project will use eminent domain and impact their properties and generations to come. It cuts my equity 50%. Uh, what I've worked 35 years to build, to leave to kids and grandkids. It's going to degrade our property values. PSEG says eminent domain is not the first option. I really hope that we don't have to use that at all. Uh, we, our preferred method is to work directly with the property owner. Now legislators are getting involved and we'll talk about one proposed plan for the use of eminent domain later in the show, but lawmakers from all across the region impacted by this proposed plan are weighing in. 
an extension cord that's you know pillaging 70 miles of farmland, wetlands, and open space in our communities. I'm strongly opposed. The most egregious part of this is the fact that it's taking away nearly a thousand farms. Now there's the question of why this project is necessary in the first place. David Lapp from the Office of People's Council argues it's not really about retiring power plants, but rather all of the data centers that are coming online in the region. In our view, PJM uh, does not respond to customer interests in the way that it responds to the interest of the utilities, the transmission owners, and the generation co companies. Customers are uh, seem to be an afterthought for PJM. Now, PJM obviously firing back, arguing that this project is all about a reliable electrical grid. In a statement, PJM says that OPC knows that and Quote, these critical issues deserve a better discussion than the ongoing exercises of finger pointing. So ultimately, this decision will come down to the Public Service Commission. So far, the PSC has yet to get an application for the project. Now, Fox 25's Jessica Babb has been covering the proposed project for months, traveling around the state. What is the response that you've seen from the community so far? Well, Mackenzie, as you mentioned, community meetings on the project have drawn huge crowds. At some of the meetings I've been to, people have filled auditoriums and community centers, in some cases with lines wrapped around the building. Farmers are worried the line could impact their productivity. I spoke with one farmer, and he says he won't be able to grow his trees and get his equipment under the lines. And it's not just farmers and homeowners raising concerns, also worried about their property value. The Carroll County Historic Preservation Commission has also voiced concerns that the proposed transmission line routes could potentially destroy Maryland history. I'm angry that PJM did not have a better planning process to look at these coal plants that are retiring and not planning in advance to bring on other renewable energy sources and perhaps small nuclear power plants. I know that energy is important, but farmland and historic properties, as I said, are finite resources and you can move power lines anywhere. And I don't believe that they fully evaluated alternatives. And another big concern for residents is the possibility that PSEG could use eminent domain to take their land. PSEG has been at several community meetings over the past few months where they have fielded questions about the issue from both residents and lawmakers, leading to some heated exchanges. And you people are just stealing people's property. That's all you're doing. Will PSEG be using eminent domain to secure land for the development of this project? I am really sorry that it's being seen as a threat. That was not... That, I was not... So let me... Please let me finish, and I want to explain, right? I get it. We put it on our website. We were getting asked the questions, and all we were saying, or what we meant to say, and I get that it didn't come across like that, is yes, we would have the same rights that's afforded any other public utility. But I want to be clear, that's last resort. We are looking to negotiate with property owners. Now, overall, many Marylanders feel like they will pay the price without seeing a lot of the benefit, especially since some of the energy needs are coming from data centers. Yeah, Jessica, are any of the state's clean energy policies coming into play in this conversation? Well, that's certainly been a big question, and according to Maryland's Climate Pollution Reduction Act, a report released back in December of 2023, it says Maryland intends for 100% of the electricity consumed in the state to be clean by 2035. And while they plan to accomplish that through many clean power sources, they admit new transmission infrastructure is needed and will be, need to be built, as well as existing infrastructure will need to be updated. Now, PSEG has attended recent community meetings. We just saw some of that right there. What about PJM? Yes, yeah, so that's again one of been the other big question. PJM has not been at recent community meetings, and that's led to frustration from community members and some elected officials saying the organization hasn't been engaged in conversation with them. A spokesperson, though, from PJM says a representative did attend community meetings back in the summer, and they say the routing of the project is up to PSEG.
All right, Jessica Baum, thank you so much for that, and thanks for your reporting. I reached out to both PJM and PSEG, asking them to join us for an interview on the program, but they refused that request. We sent questions to PSEG, asking if the company contracted out any community meetings to companies that specialize in de-escalation. The company says it did not hire a firm specializing in de-escalation, nor was anyone brought in for that purpose. We also asked if PSEG regrets not communicating with the public earlier, given the concern about the project that we're seeing now. The company not giving us a straight answer, instead saying they appreciate the feedback they've received from the public and stakeholders, and they look forward to applying that feedback as the project advances. Thursday afternoon, former governor and current Republican U.S. Senate candidate Larry Hogan spoke with community members about the transmission line in Mount Airy. He says our reporting first brought the issue to his attention, highlighting PSEG and PJM's lack of communication with the public. This is an issue that, I, that first came to my attention actually through Fox 45, and they've been talking about this a lot. There are people concerned all over three different counties about this massive 70-mile uh, you know, project that's tearing through uh, really uh, very important protected uh, uh, woodlands and wetlands and historic farms and farms in preservation and tearing things apart. Uh, we just want to get some answers and uh, find out, you know, exactly what's going on with the project and why and uh, why they haven't been working with the folks in these counties and all the property owners. We reached out to Angela also Brooks and her campaign asking if she believes the project should move forward and if the county executive has had any conversations with people who are concerned about the project impacting their homes and farms. The also Brooks campaign responding in a statement saying while the steps next will likely be conducted at the state level, also Brooks wants to focus on hearing people's concerns. The campaign also says also Brooks stands with county leadership requesting PSEG to respond to the public's concerns. Still to come, a number of Maryland lawmakers are voicing their concerns over the transmission line. I'm sitting down with two state delegates to talk about how they're planning to address it. And as we head to break, let's take a look at some of today's top headlines. Officer Jonathan Chi says what he thought was a hitchhiker turned out to be David Lithicum, and his attempt to help turned into an attempted murder. I couldn't get up and I couldn't grab my gun. It was a bad nightmare, said Chi. They believe a bullet went in my face and down my back. He's one of two officers shot and the last of four officers involved to testify. The first three responding to Lithicum's home in February of last year after his dad called 911, reporting his son suicidal and armed. Officers request a mobile crisis unit be on alert, but don't call them in. A decision the defense argues was reckless when responding to a mental health crisis and goes against Baltimore County Police policy. The recent gun and drug arrest of Maryland's most wanted fugitive, Lamont B. Johnson, who had a more than year-old outstanding warrant for murder, is yet another example of a suspect who seemingly fell through the cracks and continued to commit crime while on the run. Newly obtained court documents detailed Johnson was taken into custody by one of BPD's DAT teams, a specialized unit tasked with getting guns off the streets while on proactive enforcement in a high crime area known for drug trafficking and weapons in Northwest Baltimore. In the statement of charges, investigators detail officers chased Johnson over a fence and through a vacant home before capturing him, later finding 39 round pills on him as well as a gun they say he dropped while fleeing. Several lawmakers have raised questions about how the Piedmont Reliability Project is unfolding. I spoke with State Delegate Michelle Guyton, a Democrat from Baltimore County, who says she understands the frustration from some of her constituents and is already looking at legislation to address those concerns. I knew from the very beginning that they were going to have a, a tough road to hoe, so to say. There are a lot of fears uh, that people are going to have their, their farms divided or eminent domain is going to take a part of their property and that they might not have enough uh, say and representation in the, in the whole process. Do you believe that PJM has been as transparent as they can be about this process? I feel that they have been transparent, but they're not necessarily saying what people want to hear or what they necessarily want to know. One of the things that we ask for is for them to, as much as possible, use already existing lines, transmission lines and poles. Um, 
we have not gotten an answer from them about why that's not being considered in this process, only that it's not. And then another thing that we had asked was that they strongly consider requiring um, uh, grid enhancing technology so that we don't have to have so many lines to put new lines, but that but the technology that, that they are utilizing and requiring to be utilized in this project um, really is cutting edge technology. And it doesn't really seem like they're doing that either. So we don't have great answers as to why those choices are being made. I know what people want is to stop their project. Um, there's not a lot we can do to stop the project. There are, however, initiatives that we can put in place to make sure that our constituents' concerns are addressed. Delegate Michelle Guyton says she and other lawmakers representing areas impacted by the project are already drafting legislation, specifically trying to address the eminent domain concerns. Really, we're trying to protect farmland and land under uh, preservation, particularly environmental presentation, pres preservation, which is so important to all of us in North County, um, from being subject to eminent domain. But I've also learned that eminent domain can only be utilized when the Public Service Commission orders them to use it. Another draft she's working on? Require data centers to co-locate their own um, generation centers. Right, so they are generating their own energy. Maryland imports like 40% of our energy from outside the state. And uh, we really do use, and we're going to continue to use more than we more than we generate. Right, so we are gonna need energy from somewhere. And whether it's for data centers or for other things, that's going to come in the future. I mean, it's just planning ahead. So given that timeline and what we know about how that process moving forward, are you concerned that the legislation being drafted now and by the time it's introduced in the end of session in April, would that come too late to have any real impact on the land and the concerns from people across the state that we're hearing? I don't have the answer to that directly. That's something we're researching now. I do feel that this is not going to be a fast project. It's not something that's going to happen overnight or in the next three or four months. It's not going to be completed. Uh, so I would hope that it would have an effect or um, I don't believe this will be the last transmission line that we'll be dealing with in Maryland and that we can set, this, set the stage now for how we wanna see these things move forward now and in the future. Republican delegate from Baltimore County, Nino Mangione, has been an outspoken critic of the project. He joins us live now. Delegate, thank you so much for joining us to have this conversation. Let me ask you first, where did this idea come from and where did you first hear about it? Sorry about that. I was muted there. Um, and thank you, Mackenzie. And yeah, I heard about this project through a lot of your reporting. I've heard about this project through some of the citizen groups and activists. And of course, the town hall meetings that they were, I'm sorry, not a town hall meeting, but a meeting that they held where there was very little transparency and everybody showed up in Hereford to voice their opposition. I want to touch on Delegate Guyton for a second. I agree. And it shows that there is bipartisan opposition against this project, number one. But I also want to add that I'm not yet convinced that it has to go like this project is set to go. I think that we can do a lot of things to change the dynamic behind this project. I am opposed to how this project is being proposed. I actually have legislation as well, Protect the Maryland Farm Act, which I think is a piece of legislation. It's very similar to Delegate Guyton's. Mm -hmm. It provides for a 350% premium to be added to the highest appraisal of land as a means of compensating for farmland owners who are going to lose their income, their gainful employment, it's going to disrupt their lifestyle. So, and there's another part she discussed, and I am a very big proponent of this, and that is putting, I'm working on legislation as well, putting in or putting the data centers next to existing power sources. Data centers, they're likely playing a huge role here. Yes, we can all agree with that. There's ways to deal with this. The uh, Calvert Cliffs. I'm actually, like I said, working on legislation. If you build the data center in Maryland, the legislation will say the rule is you have to build adjacent to an existing power source. Mm -hmm. We have, we cannot have wires running all the way across the state 
We cannot have more wires running across North Baltimore County. And I think this is very important. It's been a successful model in other places. It's been tried around the world and it's worked. And Calvert Cliffs, it's clean energy. And one could even argue by doing this that putting it next to a power plant, it preserves reliability. It lowers the overall grid cost, which is very important. And it reduces the need for these massive old transmission lines that or these upgrades, I should say, that mean more and more lines coming across our constituents' homes and farms and our beautiful landscape in rural America. Now, Delegate Mangione, just to be clear, do you believe that this project is not necessary for the energy needs in this state right now, or do you just disagree with how this proposal has been presented and the process has unfolded? Well, that's a great question. Now, I understand you know, here, how we got here, Maryland has a lack of vision when it comes to energy policy. And I think it goes all the way back to the day Martin O'Malley, the former governor, walked in the office. It's these extreme uh, green energy policies and those who want to destroy the fossil fuel industry. And they've had too much control over the Maryland energy policy since those O'Malley days. It's only gotten worse since the, the Democrat supermajority has bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. So I do think that with this, is this lack of energy policy and these green initiatives, is what has increased cost to Marylanders, and it's led to these unintended consequences like the Piedmont project. Now, do I think uh, the project is necessary? Well, not in the way, any way, shape, or form that is being proposed. I think we can look into other ways, like uh, a concept called reconductoring. Reconductoring is a new emerging technology. Other countries are doing this. There's new studies that indicate it can carry twice the amount of electricity then that can be carried out. And that's basically replacing the lines with newer, stronger lines. I'm not an expert in this, but I've learned a lot about it because I've attended every single meeting possible in this. Then there's underground. Can we call on PSEG to disclose and tell us specifically how much more it would cost if you put these power lines underground? They should provide a full budget of alternative placements, such as, like I said, going underground and using these existing right of ways. I agree with Delegate Guyton there. And uh, I think that there are ways to do this. Looking at the right-of-ways, we should be seeing how many miles of right-of-ways in Maryland already exist and who own them, and from whether PGS or PSEG is just reluctant to do that because of the cost. Yeah. Well, we need to do anything we can to save our community from being destroyed by these out-of-state companies. Now, one last question for you, uh, Delegate Mangiotti. Looking ahead, I know that the PSC has said that they don't have an application in front of them, but if and when that does come before them, do you believe that PSC should, in fact, greenlight this project to move forward if the, some of the concerns are not addressed, have not been explained properly, and people still are feeling frustrated and concerned about this project? Mackenzie, I do not think the PSC, the Public Service Commission, should even consider anything to do with this project until PJM comes and answers questions from the citizens in all of the counties that are going to be affected by this project. North Baltimore County, Carroll County, Frederick County, PJM and PSCG. And I'll give PSCG credit. They've showed up. PJM has not, number one. Number two, I have started a LLC called SaveOurCommunity.org where I'm working with other citizen groups like Stop NPRP to try to stop this project. We're trying to engage a lobbyist, legal experts, to do everything we can to win the battle at the PSC, where we need three out of five votes. And that's what I'm working on, and I do not think the PSC should approve this project. All right, State Delegate Nino Mangiotti, thank you for your time. You. I'm sure we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. All right, we've heard from several lawmakers about where they stand on the transmission line, but one voice we have not heard from is Governor Wes Moore. We sent the governor a list of questions about whether he supports the project and how he's responding to the concerns from the public. The governor responding in a statement, not clarifying whether he supports or opposes the project. He did say the project was initiated by PJM, and the state of Maryland was not involved, nor is there any pending action before the state at this time. He also says any action that comes before the state will be thoroughly evaluated. And we asked you what your biggest concerns surrounding the project are. We'll take a look at some of your responses right after the break.
Now this week we asked what your biggest concerns surrounding this transmission proposal are. We got more than 100 comments and I want to show you some of what people are saying. A lot of the same sentiment we have destroying what is supposed to be protected farmland, animals, bald eagles, splitting farms up and building close to existing structures all for a project that isn't actually needed. That's obviously arguable depending on who you talk to. The gaslighting and misinformation surrounding the whole project from Brit B. It was sprung on everyone, hoping no one was going to realize what was happening or that their land was about to be taken. There are a lot of comments. We have to thank you all so much for continuing to share your opinions. That's all for this week's edition of Fox 45 News in depth. I'm Mackenzie Frost. I'm Kai Jackson. Thank you for watching. Here's another video to watch. Also, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel.